three-year-old man, a man on his own, the sort of person that you look after and help and support, a young man by the standards of some you look after, um, actually uh, pressed his panic alarm and we, we'd attended because he was worried there was someone outside. I, I think he was confused. And the third thing is, there was a harassment issue uh, between neighbours, um, but actually, to be honest with you, it was mutual aggression. It was six of one, half a dozen of another, and I'm sure you've all seen that sort of thing. Uh, and actually, people expect us to referee that and sort it out. Now, now what's th that, those three jobs in a couple of hours illustrate what's happening in, in demand in placing. We've had a tidal wave of risk around vulnerability, whether it's about elderly, sexual exploitation, missing people. So just to, to make sure that you're all still there and awake, um, how many missing people do you think we have reported to us in Avon Somerset every year? And all one type of staff? Yeah, it's John, isn't it? No. It's, uh, what, what is it? Yeah, go on, what's your name? Mark. Mark, Mark. okay. A thousand. Anyone think higher or lower? Higher. Higher. It, it, it's a good guess. It's 8,000. Um, 8,000 now, um, about half of them are children. And I'm sure many of you are parents and grandparents. Um, imagine if your child was missing, and we've seen what happens to Kelly when she's not where she's meant to be. It's incredibly worrying. It takes, on average, I was out with some top officers today, they sorted out quickly with the guy from the um, hospital. It takes, on average, 13 hours work to find them. It costs, on average, two and a half thousand pounds. And very sadly, six of the 28 that are missing every day are intent on killing themselves. This is important work, and it costs even a subsequent sum a year, the taxpayer, one whole officer's year salary every day of the year to find those 8,000 people. 365 officers looking for them. <clears throat> it, it's amazing, isn't it? Now, we have, we have other demands. Domestic abuse, as the reporting of that last year on the year um, before, went up 40%. Now, that's not because people are being more violent towards each other, in my opinion. It's because they're becoming more trusting to report it to the police. Um, society is becoming less tolerant of dealing with it, and quite rightly, um, we're, we're getting stuck into it. I think my point is that many of these crimes and offences are happening behind closed doors. And actually, if there's one thing that I've been policing for, it's to stand up for vulnerable people who haven't got a voice. And actually, you imagine if you're the victim of domestic abuse um, and you don't even feel safe in your house, that it really doesn't get much worse than that. And one place you should better go home to and feel safe. Uh, and all of us are in policing for different reasons. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm in policing. So, I mean, what, what am I doing about it? I employ just over 5,000 people. And there's one reason why they're in policing. It's not to get rich. Uh, because they're very foolish if they thought that's the reason why they put that uniform on. Um, I don't pay people enough to make them rich. They're, they're in policing because they want to make a difference and they care passionately about being successful in protecting vulnerable and catching um, criminals. Now, now actually, when you, when you go through your professional life and you only see people under two circumstances by and large, either they're having the worst day of their life because someone's died, there's been an accident, they're a victim of crime, someone's nicked all their tools, you know, this is bad, this is a bad day, or they don't want to see it because we're trying to fill their collar. Now, there is a lot of softer interaction. You know, this is nice interaction we're having today, but, but, but actually the biggest risk in policing is that we lose sight of that vocation to make a difference. <coughs> so there's a, there's a few things I've, I've got to do. I, I have got to help my officers and staff find that spark and keep it burning and so that they care about supporting each other but they care also about delivering the best possible service to you, and believe me, they do. That's what they want. I think the second thing to do is to get most um, value for money. This is what Sue's talking about, your precious taxpayers' pound. We, we've done all sorts of restructuring. Um, we have protected what can only invest be delivered locally. Your local policing boss, he's a really important guy. You're going to hear from him in a minute. He knows what's happening around here. And actually, if anything's wrong, he's the go-to person. <coughs> But actually also your safe neighbourhood teams. These are the people on the ground that you see. And as Sue said, if you lose them and we lose that trust with you, we've had it. I, I see policing all over the world where officers have to carry guns and police through enforcement and coercion only, it costs you a lot more money and ain't very good either. So I believe passionately in protecting that. So we, we've, we've federated and made constabulary-wide those resources which don't have to be local, and that means that we get the most out of, the, the, out of that investment that we're making. I think the other thing that I would say is that 
we've invested in the technology and equipment to help make them as effective as they can be. And there's a few pieces of equipment that I would draw some attention to. It's Sue that author authorises the spend of this money, and you might hear about some police forces that are sitting on a lot of reserves, while Sue's spending all of her reserves to a sensible level to help you my officers the best equipment to serve you. Now, some of the stuff they've got, they've got um, what do you want video cameras. We're one of the only police forces in the country where our PCSOs have them personally issued as well. And actually, they changed the behaviour of the officers. I mean, it's a difficult thing to hear sometimes, but, but it's switched on, and, and we, we know that we're being watched. They changed the behaviour of the people that they're recording. They gather unbelievable evidence uh, of, of what's happening that leads to early admissions, early guilty pleas, better sentencing. And domestic abuse, where we get it, for example, and the officers turn up, the camera's on, and there's children crying, there's someone with visible injury, the place is smashed up, there's an offender using foul and offensive and threatening language. They do not want the magistrates and judges to see that. They make admissions, they plead guilty, it's much better, we get better sentencing. So we've got the cameras, we also see a really significant impact in complaints. We, are, we have seen in Aiden and Somerset a backlog of very long complaints that take a long time to deal with. You're not going to see very much of that anymore because these cameras um, provide very accurate information about what's happening. I think the second thing is that, um, this is a bit that you won't see them wearing, but they, they have access to the best predictive analytics um, and use of data of any police force, I would say, in England, the world, and the world. So they can tell you who on their beat is vulnerable, who's dangerous, they can keep them apart, and they, have, they can understand where the repeat offences are happening. I mean, we've got a councillor um, here, as Gary has said. Put us another name I've got wrong, well done. Now, Paul was telling me about a problem address where there's hate crime occurring on his, on his um, patch, on his ward. The officers took me um, to that, that close to and had a look at it. So they know what's happening where, and they can patrol intelligently. Now, uh, the, the, the other thing is, is that actually we, we live in a, a world of massive data. And actually, when we know something, and we don't do something about it, and something bad happens, that can lead to a blame culture. And it's something we would all want to avoid. The way in which we use the data is helping us make sure we know what we should know. Now, you'd think that was simple with these guys on the beat, but, but let, let me give you an example. We, we have equipment that can read number plates. You've you heard of that, automatic number plates? How, how many do you think we read a day in Naval and Somerset? Thousands. Thousands. Um, millions was a shout down here. Actually, you, you're bang on here. I think you've got the missing person question wrong. <laughs> it, it's 2.4 2 million. It's 2.4 million. Now, now, actually, a day is in Naval and Somerset. When, when I joined the police, there was a collator's card, and you hold it up, and if it touched the floor, you're dealing with someone who's a bit dodgy, because there's a lot of information about it. Like, you could not write down um, the amount of information you'd get on one phone now, let alone, let alone one person. So, um, it helps us join up the dots, and why, why is that important? Let, 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 me, let me talk about a real case, and talk about why I was in policing. In Soham, in 2002, two little girls were murdered, do you remember? And it's because the police didn't use the information they had to stop something awful happening. I don't want that to happen on my patch. So the way that, that Sue is enabled through the funding of the equipment we buy, um, we, we are actually building the likelihood of that out. It's still a people-related business. Still, even when we do the right things, bad things happen, but we're minimising the risk of that. And then the last thing that I've talked about technology-wise is that, that you, know, you were saying when you look at all the kit the guys have got, um, they, they now will have um, smartphones, which have got electronic pocketbooks which they can talk into and they have to write it down, you can take statements and they'll soon be issued with um, uh, laptops which means that they take all of their business outside the police station, all of it. Now actually I know, I know at the moment because of this big data that I've got, I, I know to the minute how, how long these officers are out the police station and actually they're out the police station a lot but we can do that even better through giving them the right equipment to do the job. So actually, um, you know, how, how, how are we doing when well, we hear from you um, some of it at the moment? We, we know that we can do better, um, and that's why we're here to, um, <coughs> excuse me, we're here to listen. So I think I've probably said enough, and we'll, we'll get Nigel on, then we'll do some listening, I think. Thank you. Okay, so I was asked to um, build a presentation group. Quite a lot of what I've put down here has already been said, so I'm not going to labour um, the point and necessarily. Um, just for those of you who don't know, uh, South Bristol area to make up of 11 wards, so it's everywhere from Brislington, Bedminster, up to Hartcliffe, um, 
covering Phil Wood, Noel, uh, and all that area. Um, two of those areas, two of those wards, are actually amongst the five biggest demand wards in the whole constabulary. And Harkcliffe uh, is the single highest demand ward in, in the force. Yes, yeah, yeah, so it covers a, a, a part of that. We, for our purposes, we've built it together. Um, there are currently just over 170 police officers actually serving South Bristol based at Broadbury Road. So we've got about 100 PCs on patrol, roughly 20 a team. It can rise and fall, obviously. Uh, 22 PC posts on uh, neighbourhood. Uh, 33 PCSOs, uh, 15 sergeants and 6 inspectors. But, as with everything, when you have people who uh, are off on maternity leave, where we have people, uh, many of our PCSOs are very keen to become regular cops, um, those figures do fluctuate quite widely. And at the moment, you know, if I'm looking ahead, I am concerned as to our PCSO numbers, and it's a conversation I had with Mr. Marsh, before coming here, I know he shares that concern. It's a constant battle to get the right people into this job. And I know for, uh, that um, uh, Sue made the point around having representative workforce uh, and was talking about uh, black and minority ethnic communities, and, and yes, absolutely important. Equally as important for me is we have people that represent the communities like Philwood and Harkniff. I want people from those communities aspiring to become police officers or to work for the police. That is just as important. So your local neighbourhood team, well, we split into four essentially. So we have a team that covers Brislington, Stockwood, Hengrove. Uh, we have a team that covers Bedminster, uh, Southville and uh, sort of lower part of Bishopsworth. And we have one for Hartcliffe and one for Philwood. Okay? Those are mostly your beat managers and your PCSOs. What we have done within that team is we've taken people who've got the real passion and the real skill set and we've taken a couple of officers and we've given them a focus on drugs and that's been our operation baseline. That has been tremendously successful. Not because they're going and kicking in lots of doors, but because they're going out, they're talking to people in the community, they are talking to the users, and you, you won't believe how much intelligence and how much of a commitment there is from the users to try and get out of it. So they're quite keen to talk to us, and we're building the intelligence, we'll be very focused in that. We're finding an awful lot of concern around drugs with children, people dealing drugs from addresses and, and the hidden bit is the impact on the children that live in that address. We did a warrant not very far from here, um, we took four children out, when um, social services got involved and did some testing, uh, they took DNA samples from their hair, they were found to have the equivalent levels of drugs control drugs in their system as a user. That is the impact. They weren't using, that was the impact of just being in that vicinity. And what we're also looking to do um, is do some work, uh, Sue mentioned about having uh, a PCSO nominated, a point of contact for schools. We've gone one step further. And for schools, with the primary schools within Philwood and Harkliffe, we actually have a dedicated PCSO that spends at least one day a week in each of those schools. And what they're there for is not to deal with parking issues outside, but it's to deal with the children and the issues that are inside, because a lot of information, a lot of concern is held by schools, and they don't have the time and the resource to properly share that information. So, we're doing that, and that's where it fits in with Sue's priority around helping keep people safe. But that takes staff. It does take staff, and that's people we've had to remove from other work. So it's a very difficult balance to maintain. Specific challenges? Well, yeah, Hartcliffe has the highest rate of domestic abuse 
per person. Um, and Philwood has a second. That's across the entire force area. Um, levels of racial hate crime are higher per population than anywhere else in the force. Similar uh, picture with other hate crime. We have high levels of antisocial behaviour, particularly at the moment in Harpcliffe. Um, Philwood has previously been associated with um, lots of high levels of antisocial behaviour. I'm, I'm pleased to say over the last year that picture has not been very evident. It has been much better. But that's when, when you look at some of the data behind that, we have higher levels of children in need um, that require some form of social services intervention. Um, people out here have poorer health, particularly in Harpcliffe and Philwood. They live shorter. You might have seen a programme on uh, the news only a couple of weeks ago, which says women in Harpcliffe are likely to have died, I think, four years earlier than women elsewhere in the city. That, you know, we are part of meeting that challenge. We can't do it alone. We have to work with um, partner agencies, particularly the council. You won't be able to see that. Um, it's just an indication of the, the level of demand. Certainly in my time, the typical types of crime that we, we would focus on before, so burglary, theft from motor vehicle, robbery, those offences undoubtedly have reduced and reduced significantly. Um, I came across an old report from maybe 15 years ago and it was talking about um, robberies, and I think there have been 80 robberies in a week. If I had 80 robberies in about six months, I would be concerned. So that's the level that some of those crimes has, has come down. But as, as, as has been emphasised, it isn't just about crime. It is about keeping people safe, mental health, domestic abuse, antisocial behaviour, drugs, Road safety, it's about trying to problem solve things before they become a problem. It's about trying to intervene early to save someone going down that path. So that, that neighbourhood work, we're putting an awful lot of expectation upon those neighbourhood officers. Uh, and it's, you know, it's difficult. We can't do it alone. We need the help of partners. We need the help very much of the community. Um, and we need to reach out, we need to be involved in those communities, you need to be able to contact us, and we need to get your thoughts and your feedback and your views as to things that might work. So it's, it, we've, we've spoken around how we've tried to realign some of our teams, how we've looked at what we do, trying to do more for less money, bringing um, volunteers, citizens into, into policing, um, making sure that our local tasking, so what we're telling COPs and PCSOs to do is meeting the PCC's priorities, is meeting your priorities, and that we're working very much with um, partner agencies and, and looking at problem solving. That's good in the way. We've talked about all those innovations, so I'm not going to go with that. In conclusion, I mean, South Bristol is a great place to live and work. I have been here for the best part of 15 years. Um, I love it. It has challenges, but it has real communities. And it's that those communities actually really care about each other, and that's why you have people that live in South Bristol generation after generation after generation. I'm really proud, really proud to work here. Um, and She's right. People that work in this job, I see it, they care passionately about keeping you safe. And yes, we moan because there's less money and we moan because there's too much demand. But they still come to work every day and they still go out and they still do their own absolute best. Now, there is hope for the future. Um, I might need my glasses for this, so I'll have to read this to you. This is our mini cops. Um, it's a scheme we started in Oasis Cobalt on Melvin Square. Yeah, we, we met them last week actually, and they came to um, a sing-along at the North West Health Park, 
Oh, they were absolutely wonderful. And they come and talk to them, and, and they were all dressed in their little tabards yeah. and caps. Oh, and I was speaking to the, uh, the, P the PCSOs that were with them. And he, I had a very good idea to start from when they were children. You have just said, what, what better way of saying it than that? Yeah. This, this is, a, I, I talked about, you know, yeah. getting people aspiring to join the police from local communities. So this is a note that a nine-year-old girl wrote, and she said, I would love to be a mini police lady, I love that, mini yeah. police lady, um, because I think it would be so good for me to know what it's like. I'm thinking of maybe being a police lady when I'm older. I'd love to get to see how the dogs behave and how large, tall the police horses are. Now this is a bit that I like. I like to keep people safe by saying for people, children, to walk in the corridors and tucking their chairs in. I also like to work hard. I'm a great friend to anyone, especially if they're sad. I always take pride in how I look too. Now, if I had a police officer saying that to me, I would think that they are going to be a fantastic yeah. police officer. That is the stuff that will make a difference. Yeah. It doesn't attract the headlines. Um, it, it's very much seen as look from the local community. it's local community. Yeah. The school are actually yeah. driving it. We're helping support yeah. it. It breaks down barriers with the parents. Oh, I, I think yeah. almost almost every child there has been on some form of child in need plan. Yeah. We we know many of the families. They were so well behaved. Oh. But those families themselves, they come and they are so proud when they see their children yeah. registering and, and wearing their uniform and that is what will make a difference in 10, 15, 20 years time that will help. Yeah. yeah. I think that's where it got to start from though when, they're, when there's that sort Absolutely. of Absolutely. It's with everything. I've it's, had, it's with everything. I've had my fair share of run-ins with, with the law, <laughs> you know, with um, different issues. But I don't know. But he's his mental health. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the last yeah. one was where where I was arrested for dealing with class A drugs. All that was what was on the alleged charge charge fell sheet. Um, but it was a uh, um, on the other side of the doctor to take these tablets that I had in in the flat to mm -hmm. the pharmacy, and I was on my, on my way to drop them off at the pharmacy when. I got arrested, and they never asked me what the tablet yeah. was for. Things are often very, very complicated, and, and this, we understand is, that. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's that's where we see the future. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I would say. Yeah, I, I, I would see that. Like, yeah. you know, for, for, break, for breaking down barriers yeah. with with the police and the communities. Yeah. Yeah. We be bringing them up in a different kind of way. Yeah. It should be different. Well, I think now it's really time to open it up to any questions. So over to you. I spoke shortly, uh, briefly to Andy, uh, and I just questioned your prioritising. I'll give you an example. One boy at a day of classes, not a dwelling burglary, but he was burgled on Sunday evening. He found out on the Monday morning. He lifted the garage door up. He thought, or he, he foolishly thought he was all bailed up. He said, you really have to be able to just walk into it and work. They have his care of the electrician, first house, brass lit. Phoned up, and our dean's, that's my boy, there is a fingerprint there on a metal tray. You know, the layman can see it. They wouldn't come out. They've been classed as a dwelling burglary, although it was attached to the house. So I, me personally, the attached garage as a dwelling. Yes, it is. There's a, there's a complaint was made as well, and there wasn't her at all. I got quite reference to the top of what I was looking On a Sunday night, this was, they said they couldn't get out to, or Monday morning now, they couldn't get out to look at soccer or whatever they call it now. Nobody, nobody turned up. They just gave them a crime reference. I would, and I, that's one of them now. My future, yeah. 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 sorry. Yeah, they don't have a fingerprint in the They give it a crime reference. Let the insurance deal with it. It was murdered, can't have a room for them. Um, vulnerability now, 
my future daughter-in-law. They got to a state-of-the-art CCTV and alarm system upgrade and everything. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And as I told Andy, they've got um, a zone alarm. So if someone steps into that zone, get a little phone, mobile phone, back, they got it, it's all recorded. They've got two lots, but this was only ended in December. They've got two, where this kid is coming out, torching the car, trying the locks, facial recognition, distinct walks, and nothing's happening here. Mm. Okay. How do I, you know, on a Sunday night, a Monday morning, if it's a Saturday night and it's all kicking off downtown, you can imagine thinking about having all your people to be in a game with that. But this is a local area. Uh, yeah, it's unfortunately. Special, and it's prevalent, and you know, you're probably privy to the, the, the stats on it. It's going on, it's massive. It's a massive market with kids, to, with, with tools being in yeah. their hands. Yeah, unfortunately, that, 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 that perception that a Sunday night or any night is quieter than ever. <laughs> Sadly, it's not the case. Um, and we do unfortunately have to prioritise. And, and as we said, if it's a case of people, keeping people safe and saving potentially their lives, that has to take the first priority. So that, that does have a significant impact. That said, firstly, I'm sorry you didn't have the right service because if there was clear evidence at the scene, that should have been prioritised. You should have had.